Hi, and welcome to the Pulse of Manatee. I'm your host, Dr. Shrini Iyengar. Today we're doing something a little bit different. We're filming at the Bradenton Cardiology Center where we're gonna be talking to a number of individuals who assist in the diagnosis and the treatment of cardiovascular disease. All right, let's go. Hi, we're here at the Bradenton Cardiology Center's Nuclear Stress Lab. Today, we're talking with Dr. Mohamed Sagir, one of our newest partners in the group, who's going to tell us a little bit about chest pain and risk factors for heart disease, as well as stress testing. Dr. Sagir, great for having you here. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's go back a little bit about our patients that are coming to see you in the office. When patients have chest pain or when they have high-risk features of heart disease in their families, what is a typical workup of a patient that comes to see you in the office? Well, that's a really good question. And as a general cardiologist, I see a lot of patients, and their main concern is, am I at risk for having a heart attack? Am I having a heart attack? When I get short of breath walking around or having chest pain, is this a blockage of my coronary artery? And I think a doctor's prime asset is just talking to the patient and getting a good history and physical. A lot of times, beyond any testing, the patient will let you know in his own words what is going on. And you can come up with a diagnosis most of the time. Now, there are more than a few patients where I think, you know, I think this gentleman or this lady may have a blockage in the coronary artery. Coronary arteries are those arteries that give your heart blood, and those are the ones that when they have a blockage, they result in heart attacks. And if I think there may be a blockage there, I may order what is called a stress test. Here in this room, we have a, a bunch of treadmills, and what we do is we take a patient, we put them on the treadmill, and we walk them really fast, get that heart rate up, and see if there's a blockage. Well, before we even go to that level, I'd like to just emphasize what you said in the beginning of what we just talked about, communication. I think a lot of patients at home really would appreciate the fact that, yes, you try to communicate with them first and find out what's their history, what's their family history, what medications are they on, do they smoke? So I think a lot of those risk factors come into play really early on prior to any testing. I think that was really important you mentioned that because I think that is something a lot of people take for granted is that when we hear the history from the patient, we know what's going on. But moving forward to what you're saying about the stress lab, let's talk about that a little bit more specifically. So if you feel the patient is deemed suitable for a stress test, what exactly goes into that? So if I deem that patient is necessary for a stress test and I order uh, one of the tests we do here is a nuclear stress test. Uh, what that involves is the patient receiving uh, a little bit of a radioactive compound and it and goes... Is that a contrast? It is a contrast. It's a radioactive contrast and it goes in through the IV. And this contrast is designed to go straight to the heart via the veins. And we take some pictures and we see how the heart looks. And then what we do is we run them on the treadmill and we get their heart rate up and we give them some more contrast. And what happens is if there are blockages in the coronary arteries, big blockages, sometimes the contrast can't get to that section of the heart when the patient runs really fast. And we can see that when we take pictures of the heart. And then I can tell the patient that, you know, this test suggests that you may have a blockage in a coronary artery, and then we can further proceed from there. And the things we want to emphasize to everyone at home, though, this contrast is not the same contrast that's used in your CAT scanning or your angiograms. This is not the one that would create the allergies that they have with those types of procedures, correct? That is correct. This is not the same type of contrast of heart catheterization. This is not the same type of contrast of a CT scan. This is a very different type of contrast. Now, you said again, when, the, when this type of contrast doesn't get to the certain por portions of the heart, 
what exactly is that called? Is that ischemia is a term we use, but what would you tell the patient? Yeah, ischemia is a medical term, but you know, sometimes the best thing for a patient to understand it is there's a section of your heart that is not getting enough blood when the heart really presses itself. Uh, and this is often consistent with a big blockage in the coronary artery. But a long story short is that there's a portion of your heart that's not getting enough blood. It may get enough blood at rest, but when the heart really pumps itself and tries to push itself to the max, then it's not getting enough blood. And that's really critical to know that because we can tell levels of ischemia based on stress tests, whether it be a small area or a very large area, which may put the patient at higher risk. Yeah. Uh, you can kind of insinuate exactly how big the ischemic area is based on the nuclear test we do. We can also kind of figure out how severe the ischemia is. Sometimes you can see a very small, mild area ischemia, but sometimes it becomes a very large, severe area ischemia. And sometimes we can even tell with this test whether someone has had an old heart attack in the past. Well, Dr. Sagir, uh, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, we're back here at Bradenton Cardiology Center. I'm here with Mary Courtney. She's the supervisor of imaging services for the Bradenton Cardiology Center. Today, we're actually in the CAT scanner. So Mary, why don't you give us a little commentary about what exactly the structure is? This is our Toshiba Aquilian 64 slicer. And this CAT scanner, what is it used for? It's to detect cardiac disease, uh, vessels with blockages, and blockages in the heart and the legs? Everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, renal arteries and the arteries in the legs. And the arteries of the heart as well. And of the heart as well, yes. This CAT scanner can actually detect coronary blockages, which are the arteries of the heart, and blockages in the arteries of the neck, which are called the carotid arteries. This is also utilized to find aneurysms of the aorta, as well as blockages in the leg arteries and the kidney arteries. The utilization of this is really, really helpful for patients who really want to have an outpatient procedure, right Mary? Yes it is. And does it make it easy for them to come in and out when they get this procedure done here? Very easy. General time from the time they walk in the door until they leave is less than an hour. So what's the time of a patient going through this scanner? How much time does it take? Less than 10 minutes. Less than 10 minutes. And the fact is it looks pretty wide open in here. So do you have a lot of patients that complain of claustrophobia? We have a few but with our windows we're able to open the blinds and the scanner is open. It's a, it's much more open than most so they don't have problems well usually. that's great and the good thing is is that like i said it's usually a quick in and out service for these patients so yes, the good is. thing is as opposed to waiting in line at the hospitals we can get these uh, done quite quick here absolutely great well mary thanks a lot for your time today appreciate it thank you Hi, welcome back. We're here at the cath lab at Bradenton Cardiology Center. Today, I have Mike Bowie, who is the cath lab manager for the Bradenton Cardiology Center. Mike, why don't you tell me a little bit about what a catheterization lab does? Well, you know, this lab, what a catheterization does is we go in there and we check the patients for coronary disease, and we also check for peripheral disease. So basically, a patient can come as an outpatient and have a procedure done looking at the coronary arteries or looking at blockages in their legs. But can we fix anything in this lab? Absolutely. We, uh, the only thing uh, that, that we fix uh, anything except the coronary. So right now, a patient comes in with uh, peripheral disease. We do stenting here. We do uh, uh, renal stenting, peripheral stenting. Well, let's talk about peripheral stenting a little bit. So I have in my hand here an example of what would be a peripheral stent actually. So right. it's quite flexible and I think if the camera can get a close-up of this, you can see that the stent itself is very flexible. And these are the stents that we are placing in the arteries of the legs right now currently. That is correct. 
And the thing is, is that what else are we doing other than stenting of the legs? Well, yeah, a patient comes in with a uh, real uh, CTO vessel, then we also use the laser, which kind of like uh, vaporize, you know, the clots and all that. And so. by CTO, you mean a chronic total occlusion. For patients at home, that means 100% blockage. So when patients have these high-grade blockages, we actually have the ability at the center to use something called the laser, which Mike was just mentioning, to bust through that clot or bust through that barrier, and then we can basically balloon and place one of these stents in. That is correct. Now tell me about the coronaries, the arteries of the heart. Coronaries, uh, so basically a patient can come into our office, they, we usually either do a CT uh, CAT scan or the other option is to bring the patient in here and we'll do a, a, a coronary uh, of the, the... A coronary angiogram. A coronary angiogram. And from there, we can determine whether the patients need to get uh, stenting. So or even surgery, potentially. That is correct, yeah. And so when that happens, you know, we'll just basically decide what's best for the patient. Well, the thing is, is that the best part of the situation that we have here, it seems that patients have ease of service. They can come in and come out. It's more or less concierge service for the patient. Absolutely. It's more like a one-on-one -on -one, uh, service. Patients love to have procedure here because after they're done, you know, we follow the patient from, from the get-go, from the start to the end. So patients are very pleased with that. Well, that's great to hear, Michael. Well, thanks a lot for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome back. We're back here at the Cardiac Catheterization Lab at the Braden Cardiology Center. With me, I have Dr. Jay Matthews, a partner here at the Braden Cardiology Center and an interventional cardiologist. We're going to talk a little bit about coronary disease and peripheral vascular disease. Jay, great to have you here. Thank you very much, Randy. Okay, so let's talk a little about coronary disease. Why would a patient need to have a cardiac catheterization done? It's a great question. So there are a number of patients who might have particular symptoms that are suggestive of coronary artery disease, including chest pain, severe fatigue, or exertional intolerance. Uh, if uh, they undergo certain types of testing, like a stress test, for example, and that shows uh, some type of abnormality that may suggest an artery blockage, they can undergo a catheterization procedure. The nice thing is we can do that as an outpatient here in the uh, office, and uh, we can diagnose an underlying heart blockage. Would you take me step by step? When a patient comes to the office for a cardiac catheterization, how does the procedure actually get done? So what happens is, after some initial pre-testing, the patients are brought here to the lab, uh, the, to the lab and uh, by lying down on this table here, we are able to then insert a small IV catheter into the artery. Uh, by doing this, we insert catheters. This is a relatively painless procedure. And this is the artery in the groin, the femoral correct, artery. Correct, correct. Or even the radial artery within the wrist. Uh, in both uh, methods, we're able to get to the heart artery by uh, p passing catheters into the uh, uh, coronary arteries and injecting dye. And then on the x-ray images, we're able to see what the arteries look like. And great, so when we get that type of imaging, we can basically make a diagnosis if a patient has a high-grade blockage or not. That's correct. Well, let's move down from the heart down to the abdomen to the legs. What else can we do here at the Brady Cardiology Catheterization Lab? Well, one thing that we primarily do here as well is peripheral vascular imaging. So uh, pretty much anything outside of the heart arteries is peripheral vascular. And uh, we are able to image the carotid arteries, the mesenteric arteries, which are the arteries of the, the abdomen, and also the, the, the leg arteries as well too. And uh, for a number of these arteries, if there are blockages within them, we have the ability to repair these arteries potentially with stents or with lasers and balloons. Now, describe the laser again. So what, we, what would you do if a patient came to you and said, I have a lot of leg pain, my calves burn when I walk, and it only gets better when I rest, and their testing shows that there's potentially blockages in the legs by ultrasound or by CAT scan. How do you then assess that patient? So after we have the appropriate testing, what we do is plan out the procedure and then we identify uh, where we think the potential blockage is. After this, we then do a catheterization type procedure, and instead of going up to the heart, we go down to the legs. Almost like a U-turn. Correct. And then uh, by doing that, uh, we're able to inject dye, identify the area of blockage, and then by using certain catheters, we're able to uh, to cross these lesions. If they're totally blocked up, we have special techniques that we use to get through these blockages. Now the laser, what it does is it allows us to vaporize the plaque. 
And in certain cases, we're actually able to just use a laser and a balloon and leave nothing behind and actually get a very nice result. And and that's really the main concern here is the patients can come in and out of the lab here. And I think that's one of the take home points for everyone watching is, is that as an outpatient lab, no one is staying overnight and we can discharge pretty much 100% of the patients to home after the procedure. It's great because you don't have to go to the hospital. You don't deal with the rigmarole of actually being involved in the hospital. You don't have the infection ex uh, exposure. You have a same day service and you have a one on one uh, care as well. So the same person that you meet at the beginning of the day is the same person that discharges you as well. So we've been talking about peripheral vascular disease, which is PVD for short. Let's talk about a scenario. A patient comes to see you in the office and we'll assume that she's in her mid 50s and she's complaining of her calves burning or hurting when she walks and she can only get relief when she stops walking. Jay, tell me, how does it work up? What do you do for that patient? Absolutely. So, you know, the concern here is that they may have an underlying artery blockage that could be causing their symptoms. So initially what we do is some very simple testing, something called the ankle brachial index. And what this is, is we use blood pressure cuffs on the arms and the legs, and we simply measure a ratio to see if there is a pressure difference. If there is a pressure difference, and typically an ABI of less than 0.9 is considered abnormal. Uh, if we have a pressure difference, then we may move on to some more advanced testing. The advanced testing could include an ultrasound, uh, an arterial duplex ultrasound, which can actually identify the blockage, or sometimes a CT scan to actually show us where the blockage is. And the thing is, the take home point too is, is obviously, if you're having symptoms of this nature, but your pulses are intact or you're having warm feet, we have to think of other etiologies like neurogenic sciatica or nerve pinching that may be causing this as well, correct? That's absolutely right, because uh, not all leg pains are due to artery problems. There's neuropathy, uh, it could be due to arthritis, uh, uh, there are a number of different conditions. So uh, these types of testings uh, allow us to uh, identify the underlying cause. And oftentimes it's not just one thing, it could be multiple things. And the great thing you just mentioned is you went from an ankle brachial index to potentially an ultrasound to a CAT scan to potentially here in the cardiac catheterization lab. The beauty of all of this is it can be done in one center. That's correct. Now let's go from the CAT scan to the cardiac catheterization lab. When these patients come in, we have the ability here to repair potentially any lower extremity arterial disease. Absolutely. So. When a patient comes in and gets a CAT scan or an arterial uh, ultrasound, we're able to identify the level of the blockage. After this, we can use this for procedural planning and here in the outpatient setting, insert a small catheter into their artery and actually perform an angiogram. By doing this, we're able to identify the blockage and then potentially fix it in that same setting. Well, let's go back to the first step here. When a patient says they have burn in the calves, let's let everyone know at home, the medical term we use is called claudication. Now, whether it be caused by a vascular blockage or a nerve pinch can be diagnosed over time with these tests. Now, when someone comes to your office, OJ, what are the symptoms that we should tell everyone at home to be watching for? So they should know that maybe I have PVD. Absolutely. Now, the most classic symptom is uh, uh, cramping or burning within the calves with activity. But it's always not that simple. I mean, it's, it's, sometimes there's a, there are subtle uh, differences like uh, coolness or numbness or burning at night, uh, sometimes skin changes, uh, poor color of the feet, uh, it, it, sometimes uh, ulcerations of the toe and whatnot too. Especially in diabetics, we can see uh, a, a number of changes that are concerning for arterial insufficiency. And that's the important another point here. If you have diabetes, watch your feet, look at your feet, make sure you examine them daily because those are the types of patients that develop these types of arterial problems because of their underlying diabetes. And of course, Jay, we all know, we tell our patients, stop smoking. Very, very important to know that as well. So Jay, thanks a lot for your time today. Thank you. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Alberto Montalvo, Managing Partner of the Bradenton Cardiology Center. Dr. Montalvo, thanks for being here. Thank you. Well, why don't you give us a little bit of the background of this amazing center? You have to understand that Bradenton Cardiology was really the vision of George Thomas, 
that to, and together with D Dr. Butler Smith created the whole Center of Brinton Cardiology. Um, they, they joined forces in 1984 uh, and started in a small office across the street from Manatee Memorial Hospital. Um, uh, initially, it was just him and uh, Dr. St Dr. Thomas and Dr. Smith. Uh, I joined them in 1987, and since then, we've been adding excellent cardiologists like you uh, to our center to essentially and increase... And that was unpaid for, folks at home? <laughs> <laughs> to increase the capacity of cardiology services for the community of Manatee County. Well, that's... A Great right. point, because right. today we had walked around and we've seen a number of things in the building, the cath lab, the echo lab, the CT scanner, the nuclear stress lab. So th the amount of technology that's in this building is quite impressive. Correct, correct. Right. Now, tell me something personally about yourself. When you first started here, you performed the first percutaneous coronary intervention in Manatee County. And that was exciting times. Uh, back in 1987, uh, again, the vision was to be able to bring first diagnostic cardiac catheterization and then coronary intervention followed by bypass surgery uh, in those years, 1987-1988. Those were the days of simple balloon angioplasty because there were no stents. Um, and yes, the first coronary angioplasty in Manatee County was performed in 1988. That patient, by the way, still sees me on a regular basis. And that's the important thing about consistency with this practice as well, because right. we've been around for about 27, 28 years at least. Correct. Now, how, what would you say, Alberto, to patients that come to see you for the first time? What is the big point, take home points to any patients watching this or people watching this right now about cardiovascular disease? Without any question, the technology and the advances, uh, advancements in science has given us the opportunity to really, number one, treat the, the cardiac conditions that we deal with uh, every single day. And second, there's a tremendous amount of prevention that we can do. So from the patient who has a family history of heart disease, who needs to be checked and needs to be on preventive measures for, uh, to prevent problems in the future, to the patient who is actively having problems, we have the facility, we have the technology to take care of them. And the thing is, is that family history with these patients is very important too, correct? Correct. I think that's the number one, number one factor. I think if, if your parents have had heart trouble in the past, don't wait till it's too late. Take care of it early. And smoking, obviously, being one of the biggest risk factors. Correct. Now, have you had a lot of success with these patients quitting smoking in the past? I have. There's a small segment that is very difficult to change, but I have found persistence, uh, encouragement and all the different new medications available there, uh, we've been successful probably in 90, 98 percent of the time. And I agree with you completely. Like communication, and again, communication with the physician and the patient is very important. And I think that one of the things we've had or we've seen in Brayden Cardiology Center is the consistency of the program itself. The practice has been around for so long. I think people have come to rely on this as being one of the statues or one of the areas of Bradenton that they know they can come to. Exactly. Well, Alberto, we've talked about a number of the technologies and modalities available here at the Bradenton Cardiology Center to treat patients with heart disease or vascular disease. But let's go back a step. What do we tell the people at home watching? How do we prevent that disease process from even starting? There's many things that the individual can do to prevent heart disease. Uh, number one, diet. You know, we, we have to be careful with, with the foods that are rich in saturated fats and, and high cholesterol. We need to change that diet, even, I say, even, even from the school, school time, you know, even in the schools, we probably need to start gradually changing the diet of, of, of children. Exercise. We all have to exercise on a regular basis. I think a sedentary lifestyle promotes heart disease. So. A simple walk every morning is important for anybody, you know. Most of us exercise on a regular basis because we see the effects of what it does. I think people have to do that. Um, we already talked about quitting smoking. I think people need to quit smoking if they have, if they have by any chance picked it up in the past. Um, uh, maintain your weight under control. Um, check your cholesterol. Have regular checkups. And the main thing really is, is that what we're trying to tell everybody at home is you can't change your relatives, but you can change your lifestyle. That's the important take-home point here. So once again, Alberto, thank you for coming today. Thank you.
Well, folks, that wraps it up for another episode of The Pulse of Manatee. I'm your host, Dr. Srini Iyengar. I'd like to thank Drs. Alberto Montalvo, Dr. Mohamed Sagir, and Dr. Jay Matthew, as well as all the staff here at the Braden Cardiology Center for accommodating us today. Remember, a positive mind results in a positive body.